If you would, please open your Bibles to the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And we want to thank as our text, chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. 20, verses 1 through 10. That's why you're going there. I want to point out that we're going to examine in general the doctrine that pervades so many different people who believe in Christ. And that is premillennialism. We won't cover all of it, but we tend to. But it is basically the doctrine that says when Christ came, the Jews would not believe he was the Son of God, so he did not set up his kingdom, he set up his church. And uh, that, therefore, as you go through time, the Lord is going to set up later his kingdom and reign on earth a thousand years. So in this sermon, we want to study about the tribulation and the thousand year reign. These are parts of the overall false doctrine of premillennialism. So we begin with then our text, chapter 21 through 10. There's no one text in the Bible that has been more misused than the one we're looking at right now, Revelation 21 through 10. And to a great extent, the doctrine of premillennialism is based on one particular view or interpretation of this text. Based mostly on this text, uh, this view of it. Many believe that Jesus is coming back to the earth, and on this earth, to reign on the literal throne of David for a literal 1,000 years. Now, I'm going to exclude the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses from this because they do not believe Christ comes back to earth. They believe he will be in heaven with a literal 144,000 and rule 1,000 years from there with the earth turned into a garden of Eden again Everybody that's not a part of 144,000 literal people will be on earth like Adam and Eve were before the fall. But most of those who claim to be Protestant denominationalists believe, as I just stated, that Christ will come back to this earth when he comes and rule over his kingdom that he will set up at that time from Jerusalem a literal thousand years. In addition to that belief, and connected with it, there's the idea of the tribulation. And this is the view that at the event known, according to premillennial views, as the rapture, rapture, all of the faithful will be taken to heaven. Now that means, they will say it this way, quote, the church will be raptured away, unquote. And the reason that happens, per their false doctrine, is that those but I have to go through the great tribulation because it will be as it could be. That doesn't mean that in the tribulation, as they define it, people can't be saved. It just means from their perspective, if you were saved in the church, you'll be raptured away. You know, this in case of rapture, this car will be empty and this kind of thing. They've made a movie about it. You will see their view of it. It's, it's available on uh, various places on television. And that, that is the uh, great teaching of many people pertaining church and kingdom and how things will be at the end time per their human teaching. Now following this so-called rapture, there will be a period of seven little years of tribulation. And following this seven year period of tribulation, after the fall of the rapture, they define it. Then our Lord will return according to the doctrine. And uh, for a thousand years, he'll sit on David's throne in Jerusalem and established his kingdom. Let me say again, many, many people believe these concepts. They think, honestly, that the Bible teaches these concepts. Now, the question is this. Are these things we just mentioned concerning premillennialism, are they biblical concepts? Does the Bible actually teach this course of events will happen? With the foregoing mind that I want to study with you for a little while, what the Bible teaches that we can see 
about these two particular issues pertaining to premillennialism because in the general doctrine they hold very important positions in that thinking, the tribulation and the thousand year reign. First of all, we'll look at the tribulation. I want to read, the, before we do that, verses 1 through 10, you read with me in chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Cast him in the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal upon him. That he should deceive the nations no more, until a thousand years should be filled, fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived the reign of Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is that is he that hath part in the first resurrection. For such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God with Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, God and Magog, to gather them together to battle, and number of whom, the number of whom is as, as the sands of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and had the blood city. And I came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented in a day and night forever and ever. Now let's realize that much of what I've been talking about by way of introduction, they think they find in these ten verses, as well as other places, but these in particular. First of all, I want us to look at the word tribulation. It comes from the Greek word thlipsis, and it means to be pressed together. Symbolically, therefore, it means stress. It means tribulation. It means afflictions. And it's found in uh, four or five times in the New Testament of Christ. It is translated 21 times in the New Testament tribulation. It's translated affliction some 17 times. Uh, the remainder of the times that Philipsis is found is translated trouble, anguish, persecuted, and burden. Now there's, remark this, no special reason within this word to consider it as referring to a special period. That's very important in our approach to the scriptures and ascertaining what is in them. Because what I've just told you these people have to apply tribulation in a way that fits the premillennial view that after the church has been raptured away for seven literal years of tribulation. But there's no reason this word is to be considered to apply to a seven year period as I just described it. Requirements that are necessary for that kind of seven year period of tribulation following the premillennial doctrine of rapture would be these. The doctrine says that after the rapture, there will be a period of seven years in which the church will suffer extreme persecution. Now notice what is required for such a doctrine to be biblical. First, there must be a seven-year period, a literal seven-year period. Second, there must be persecution for the whole church, not just a few congregations, but the whole church. Third, there must be persecution for Christians only. And fourth, these events must happen, they must happen after the rapture as premillennialism describes it. So what does the Bible say about the concept of tribulation? Well, it is true, first of all, some periods of tribulation are discussed in the Bible. When you go to Matthew chapter 24, 
Mark chapter 13, and even Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, you'll see that people are going through, as it's described there, some kind of tribulation. Now, when we look at what's talked about in Matthew chapter 24 and Mark chapter 13, you will see that his Jesus' teaching there pertains to the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed because Christ had come. Christ had died at the hand of the Jews and then buried. He had been raised from the dead. He ascended to heaven. And as Acts chapter 2 declares, he was sitting at the right hand of God because on that day the Lord's church, his kingdom, was established. That's very important to understand. He's sitting and ruling when you don't rule over something that doesn't exist. So 2,000 years ago, Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, along with the other apostles, declared him to be sitting and ruling on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. So Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. The destruction of the Jews. They have no longer a reason to exist in the divine economy because they fulfill their purpose. And thus, in 70, by the providence of God, through the legions of Titus and Rome, Jerusalem, and the Jews as we know them and back in the time when we read of the scriptures, were completely destroyed. God set them up, and when they finished, they were destroyed. And they'll never exist again. Because there's no way they know who's of what tribe. And without that, they can't know uh, the tribe of Levi. They can't know from where the priest can come. And they can't know the lineage of descendants of uh, Aaron. So they can't have a high priest. And so on. Now, moreover, this needs to be brought out. This tribulation, let me emphasize it. This tribulation that is spoken of in Matthew 24, Mark 13, has to do with the city of Jerusalem. That's the point I've been making. Not Christian only. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, we find it speaking about the persecution of one congregation. This is in the letter section, the seven churches of Asia, and it's only talking about what went on in that one congregation, not the worldwide church of our Lord. Persecuted, yes but it applied to one particular congregation and their needs and their perseverance. Now let me pause here again and say what I've said many, many times, and all of us must keep in mind, if we're to rightly divide or handle it right, the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, as we study the Bible. If we come to a conclusion that a passage meant something, but it could not find any kind of application to the people to whom it was originally sent, it did not have meaning to them. It wasn't practical to them and their faithful living for the Lord. We have come to the wrong conclusion. Let's remember that these letters that make up the New Testament of Christ were written to individual Christians and the churches pertaining to the things they needed to them. Now the truth of the whole New Testament system is in all of that because he applies that truth to them and that's the way God has said that wisdom chose to reveal the mind of Christ, the perfect law of liberty is able to provide. It is incumbent upon us as good Bible students in ascertaining the authority of our Lord, learning our obligations to Him that are permanent and never change, that we not bring over the problem at that time to which the truth that is the same today as it was then was applied. That's very important. And it's especially important the book of Revelation or any book that is written in figurative language. If those figures did anything those people at the time was written, that is, could be applied to them, if you're the reason the book was written, then we've got the wrong conclusion. So these passages do not meet the requirements of premillennial doctrine. Second, the number seven is never in the same context as the word tribulation. Yet the doctrine demands seven literal years of tribulation following the concept of the rapture of the church. Because they were used together with it. Where they come up with it. I want to pause here and say this. If you have adopted in your mind, it's gone through your life for years and you've got it from others, the whole skeletal outline of premillennialism, then you're going to look at the Bible through those spectacles. 
And if I've got all red tinted glasses and I look at that white wall, that wall's going to be red tinted. It is incumbent upon us, it's our obligation as good Bible students to act only in what the Bible teaches and understand only what it teaches. That we remove all prejudicial things from our eyes, from our mind's eye. That we can understand only what the Bible right and divided actually says. Now third, the only place in the Bible where the concept of rapture is mentioned is when Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. And even then, that concept is not applied the way it is in premillennial doctrine. There's nothing wrong with the word rapture as long as you understand how the Holy Spirit in the Bible used it. Now the way the premillennials use it is not like the Holy Spirit uses it. Let me read a little bit from Paul's writing to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 13, he says, I'm going to write to you about those folks that are dead. He calls them asleep. Because when a person is dead, they usually uh, look like they're asleep. But I would not have you to be ignorant. Well, he's going to enlighten us. Bread. Talking about the bread. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with you. That's the resurrection. At the end of the world. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before those which are asleep. The King James says, Prevent the word meaning change from the Jews today in the New King Church, the King James Version, and others. Make the necessary proper translation in modern English. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, do you see how that has nothing to do with the idea that here's the church it exists because the Jews would not believe Christ is the Messiah, the King, and thus He's going to come back after the church has been raptured away and He's going to set His kingdom and rule out of Jerusalem on the earth for a thousand literal years? You don't see anything like that here. You see a discussion at the end of time when the resurrection takes place and what's going to happen to those alive on the earth when the Lord comes, who are faithful, and those who are dead. And coming with it. That's all that you've got. No use making out of it something it does not say. So if you're going to talk about a rapture that is scriptural, then those who are raised are raptured. But it's not the rapture that you read of in primitive doctrine. So the question is where in this passage I just read is the tribulation? Did you read about it? It's just not there. You're not reading into it or a false doctrine, but the words themselves don't say it. So where is in this passage also the reigning of Christ on the throne of David? Literally sitting on a material throne in Jerusalem, the throne of David. It's not there. You can't find it. You can't find it. No, it's not there. Fourth, in contrast to the idea that there will only be a period of seven years of persecution. Tribulation. The Bible teaches that the church is constantly under persecution. Where do we get the idea that as long as the Lord's people are on this earth, the devil will not be a roaring lion going about seeking to be made about him? He never sleeps. For as far as a day, he seeks to destroy every member of the church. And that means persecution is going to come. Listen to this array of scriptures. Jesus speaking to the apostles regarding his leaving. And what they would do as his, his ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth. John 16, verse 33. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Then in Acts 14, 22, in the time of Paul's beginning to preach, at least in his journeys, it says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, that is, remain faithful to the church, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. 
So sometimes I think it would be these things that well, you can be as faithful as possible when you won't suffer too much. In fact, there's some doctrine who say if you'll just be really faithful like the Bible teaches, you won't really go away trouble at all. That's contrary to what Paul said. We must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. That's constant. That's regular. Romans 5, 3, and not only so, Paul writes, we glory in tribulations also. Knowing the tribulation for Second Corinthians 4, 17, to the brethren of Corinth, for our light affliction. When you think what Paul would have meant, but he still calls it light affliction. Which is but for a moment. Working for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Now question, is there a period when the church has been persecuted greater than others? The answer is yes. Because it was surging up and down with persecution all the time. But nothing in regard to the seven year period of tribulation following the so called rapturing of the church before the Lord comes back to set up his kingdom and rule a thousand years from Jerusalem. That's not in the Bible. The requirements of the doctrine thus are not found in the Bible. And if they're not there, how do we form a view of it based on only, only, only what the Bible teaches? There's no rapture as they define it, followed by tribulation. No seven-year period of tribulation. You can't find it in your Bible. It's not there. No limited persecution of the whole worldwide church for seven years. That's not there. No special time of persecution for Christians only. We must conclude then with the facts at hand that this doctrine comes from the fermented imaginations of men and not from the inspired and foul and error all sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man in the Bible. Well, now let's turn to the thousand year reign. We do have a passage in the scripture that discusses this. I read it in Revelation 20 and the first six verses is brought out. But I must ask again, as I did about the seven liberal years of tribulation following the premillennial view of, of rapture. What are the requirements? What are the requirements of a thousand year reign according to premillennial life? First of all, it must be a literal thousand years. Christ, number two, is coming back to live on earth. I'd like to see somebody show me that. Next, Next of all, Christ must reign, rule, exercise his dominion as king on the literal throne of David in the actual literal city of Jerusalem. I must ask the question, since that's the doctrine, what does the Bible say about this thing? Does Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6, Teach a literal thousand year reign. And let me hasten to say, I don't know of anybody that says the book of Revelation is not written to your language. That is a must to understand it. And it must be recognized that some of the Bible literature is for your language. I must ask, verses 1 through 6 of chapter 20, what's the context? That means what is the literary environment of this thousand years? And is the book of Revelation literal or figurative? Let's see. How do I know that it's figurative? I should have asked that a moment ago. Well, it's really very simple. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And by the way, that was written almost 2,000 years ago. And it was shortly come to pass almost 2,000 years ago. And now watch. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So how do I know that the book of Revelation figurative and not literal because of one word. 
He sent and signified. Brother, Brother Floyd Wallace used to say, look at that, signify. It's signify, signify, it's a sign. That's the verb form of the Greek word, sign. Now we would consider, as I've said many times in preaching on this, somebody would be short of load if they were to drive up to a gasoline sign itself and try to get gasoline out of the sign. You would know that a gasoline sign says at this station there is gasoline and you can pump it and you can buy it. So a sign, listen, is never a sign itself. A sign always points to something else. Thus, it is not literal. That is common sense study of language and literature and the symbolism that might appear in any language, whether it's Japanese, Hebrew, or Russian. So what about Revelation chapter 20? Is it literal? Or is it figurative? Well, as you read through here, you'll read about a key, K-E-Y. Is it literal or figurative? You'll read about a pit, B-I-T. Is it literal or figurative? You'll read about a, a chain. Is it literal or figurative? It's figurative. as so much as it is. You know, there's a dragon mentioned in here that knocked a third of the stars out of the universe with his tail. Now, literal or figurative? And sometimes we'll see people saying, well, I... That fish was as big as a whale. Understanding the person's character, is he lying or just embellishing a thing to show you that he's called a big fish? We all do it. Sometimes people do it intending to lie, but not here. He sent and signified, signified it by the angels of John. All right? So the immediate context of our passage is obviously figurative and not literal. We also know that 1,000 is used figuratively in the Bible. We don't have to look at it in Revelation. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Time is nothing to God. He made it, He works in it, He worked out of it, He worked all of it in. But time doesn't go to God as far as His being. To suggest that this passage teaches a little thousand years is to take it out of its context. And when you take something out of its context, it becomes a pretext, and thus it does not teach the truth. We must want to study whether it's literal or figurative. We must want to study it in its context. And another great rule I may mention later is that you always strive to understand the figurative in the light of the plain. Whatever the book of Revelation figurative language has to say about the church, in figurative language, symbolic language, you're not going to change the thing about what it says about the church in plain language of the rest of the Testament. Not at all. It was written to persecuted Christians designed for them to understand what it said so that those doing the persecuting wouldn't understand it at all. And when you go back to 1 Thessalonians 4.17, you see that it teaches that at the end of time, when the dead are raised incorruptible, that we all, having been changed, the living having been changed on earth that is coming, will be with Christ, not on earth, but will be in heaven with Him forever. Now, that is the burden of Paul's writing where he has to answer some questions. In verse 15, regarding the matter, in verses 23 through 24, Scripture reads, but talking about the resurrection, and every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, he's the first one to be raised to the dead and die before. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Now watch. Then cometh the end. Not the beginning. Then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Not set it up and begin to rule. Be in the Father. When he shall have put now all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is dead. Now watch. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he, has, when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which he hath put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 
You know, that will change in a lot of ways when the Lord comes back and this world ends and the dead in Christ shall rise first and those who are alive shall be raptured, if you please, not like Raymond Lindalism teaches, and we'll all meet the Lord there and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't believe that. I'm sorry, that's what the Bible said. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, I think the Lord will be on earth setting up his kingdom. It says, then come to the end, we shall put it down on the room of the Lord. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And he wrote this letter. He was reigning. He just said he was reigning in uh, Acts chapter 2. What did that kingdom what was he reigning on? So at the end of time, the Lord comes back, there will not be a kingdom established, but he'll put down all room and all authority. He'll deliver his name back up to his father, to God. So, after Christ's coming, comes the end, not the beginning of his kingdom and his reign. There's no passage of Scripture that teaches that Christ is going to come back to live on this earth. It's not there. This old sin occurs for earth. He will never set foot on again. Is Christ going to reign on the literal throne of David, the literal city of Jerusalem? Not what the Bible says. The Bible says, well, I got it out of the Bible. Yeah, you get it way out of the Bible. Because there's not any words in the Bible that teach such a thing. There's no Scripture explicitly, and that means in just so many words, or implicitly, that teaches such things. In Acts 2, chapter 2, verses 30 through 36, the inspired Luke records the Apostle Peter teaching on that day the church started, that, as I said earlier, that Jesus is sitting on the throne of David at that time. Folks, that was 2,000 years ago. If he was sitting on the throne of David at that time, yet he's at the right hand of God, Christ is ruling over his church kingdom at that time. And that, of course, even destroys the idea that the church is a separate independent institution from the kingdom, and the kingdom is independent of it. The church is the kingdom, the kingdom is the church. And they're one of the same. They seem to describe different aspects of it when we understand the kingdom and when we understand the church. So Christ must reign on the literal throne of David in the literal city of Jerusalem if you're going to have that doctrine. But that is not the case. Moreover, when you look at chapter 20, there's no discussion of the duration of the reign of Christ. You understand? But, but the duration of the reign is the saints. Now, I want us to be careful what we're going to say here. It really does not speak to the extent, let me emphasize that, to the extent of Christ's reign at all. That's it said in Revelation 20 about that. Was Christ not reigning prior to this period? Will Christ not reign after this period? Well, that's not consistent with 1 Corinthians 15 25. So, what does Revelation chapter 20 teach figuratively? So, we need to consider some rules of interpretation of actually the Bible part, of understanding. Language. First, we need to ask ourselves what this meant to those to whom it was originally written. That would save a whole lot of problems. It would simply approach you to say, what did it mean to the people to whom it was originally written? We have to know what were their circumstances, what were their situations. How would this comfort those Christians almost 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire? Next, one doesn't understand something that is literal in terms of figurative. I can't only state that. But one understands the figurative in terms of the literal, and this is a figurative passage. Next of all, we need to consider the context of the passage. Now, this is a rule you apply to anything, especially figurative language. Revelation, the apocalypsis as it's called, there's the dragon. One enemy. There's a false prophet. He's another enemy. And there's the beast. Another enemy. There's also the great heart. And these are four great enemies that are sent out in the book of Revelation. When you come to chapter 19 of Revelation, we see the defeat of the harlot. Revelation 19.2. The beast and the false prophet Chapter 19, verse 20. Then, then in chapter 20, we see the defeat of the dragon. Those are symbolic terms, figurative terms. 
So what does the text say? An angel comes with a key and a chain. Not an angel binds the dragon with a chain. He casts him into the pit and he seals the door. Why, why, why all of that? According to the text, so that he can't deceive the nations anymore. The word nations here is the word which is normally translated Gentiles. Those who were martyred and those who did not worship the beast, it's as important as we interpret this, those who were martyred and those who did not worship the beast reign with Christ a thousand years. Anybody's going to reign at the reign while they're reigning on the end of time, what's he going to do about his reign? He's going to put it down. So he's talking about people, a certain group of Christians who would reign with Christ. But Christ has been reigning since Acts chapter 2. He was reigning when this book was written. And he's reigning right now. And he'll reign at the end of time, according to Paul, verse 50, 16, when he shall put down all rule of all authority. And there's a kingdom back up to God. This is the first resurrection. You cannot always interpret a word the exact same way every time. When you see the coming of Christ, people automatically will say, the end of time, the end of the world, the coming of Christ. It doesn't always mean that. I think it was brought out again some weeks ago, and we denied that the coming of Christ is also used to describe the coming of the legions of Rome of old destruction of Jerusalem. You can see that in Matthew 24, where he also uses some figurative language in talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. So those who died as martyrs, he limits it to martyrs. They died for the cause of Christ like Stephen. He pictures them as victorious and reigning with Christ. Again, the thousand year reigns is the reign of the saints, not of Christ. The rest of the dead do not live until the thousand years finish. Now, what's going on here in right now? Literal thousand years. A whole many. Please realize that numbers from the book of Revelation in their figurative usage lose their numerical meaning. If you try to keep their numerical meaning, you won't understand anything. And most people who are pretty plenty will do that. Literal thousand years. Literal seven years. You'll see that Satan is then loosed for a short time. Well, look at your scripture. Why? To deceive the nations, the Gentiles. That is, he has power to deceive people. He's going to be loosed. Is he deceiving people right now? <coughs> yes, the plain part of the Bible says that he's as a royal lion going by seeking you made a power. Peter even wrote that at the time the figurative language was used here in Revelation. Satan's influence brings the nations of the Gentiles in conflict with the saints and the blessed city of Jerusalem. Are you getting the drift of the whole book as to who was doing the persecution of the church at the time this book was written and who they were being warned about? He's talking about the government of Rome. The opposition to them. I'll significant to note that after AD 70, it was forever settled that this is not a sect of the Jews. There are thousands and thousands of Gentiles who need to obey the gospel. The Jews are gone, but this thing keeps growing. Nero had already seen some of that in the 60s. But then between AD 70 and 100, it grew by leaps and bounds. That is the gospel. The people obeying the gospel. And guess who? When Jews, Gentiles, were obeying the gospel. And that caught the view of the Roman Empire. Well, instead of annihilating the saints, the fire from heaven destroys the nations. And they, along with Satan, are cast in the lake of fire and brimstone. What does that say? It doesn't make any difference how bad it looks or how much government strive to destroy you to make a modern application of it. It won't work. If you look at things right now from a human perspective and not from what we know about the Bible, Church had got a chance. We walk the faith, not the sign. 2 Corinthians 5 7. 
And that's exactly what's being said to these people in the midst of the Roman Empire, the spring of the whole force of government to bear upon persecuted church. It may look bad, but it's not. From the standpoint of who's going to have the ultimate victory. As somebody said in summation, the whole book of Revelation is this. Christians win. The angel represents the messengers of the gospel. It doesn't necessarily mean a heavenly being. But it means the messengers of the gospel. Because angels basically mean the messenger. Every member of the church can truly be said to be an angel in the sense that they're expected to do what they can't teach the truth. The key in the chain represents the gospel and its power to bind Satan. There's nothing else going to bind Satan to anybody except that person's obedience and faithfulness to the gospel. And he can't touch you. Or when you kill a body, we can't touch your soul. Didn't Jesus teach that? And that's what they had to be reminded about. Acts 46, 18. Satan's bound by the message of the gospel. Satan cannot break nor escape the gospel, Hebrews 2, 14. In fact, just look at that passage for a moment. It's a beautiful passage that we ought to keep in mind. Hebrews 2 and verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Now listen. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now the book of Revelation, if you read language, is basically saying what that said in a few words of plain language. That the devil can't destroy you. Why he can? No, he can if you love the truth and obey it. If you follow the gospel, nobody can destroy you. Well, they can kill my body. Let me ask you something. The flesh and blood here in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it couldn't. We're going to heaven in a glorified body. Feeding for eternity even as his body is fitting for now. I wish we could get in our heads that we're not going to get our reward here. I'm not going to stay here as much as we seem to do. Oh, I'm going to go to heaven. That's where my home is. That's where everything I live for is. And that's what we need to understand. Well, our time's running over. I've covered about all there is on this. I will summarize for a moment that God's people have always been and will continue to be persecuted. Although that tenth in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, all who live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's not a special thing. Persecution ought to encourage us to be faithful. For in Paul, Romans 5 3, these line of fictions, as Paul used the term, will produce for us an eternal way to glory. 2 Corinthians 4 17. And the gospel is man's only hope for salvation from the clutches of Satan. 2 Timothy 1 10. It's the power of God to save. Romans 1 and uh, verse 16. If we obey the gospel and take part in the first resurrection, when was that? When I was baptized into Christ and raised to walk in this life, no man died before I was baptized. And I was baptized a dead man to rise a new creature. I will undergo the first resurrection. And then we have no concern about the suffering of the second death, which is eternal departure from God and the devil's hell, Revelation 26. Those who obey live. And die, having been faithful to the Lord, and shall reign with Him. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. Satan will ultimately be defeated, and all those who served Him will be cast into hell. Revelation 20 and 10, verse 15, chapter 21 8. Don't let people take your language and make it out something that the plain language, the literal language of the Bible does not teach. We're under tribulation all the time for faith to God. God will deliver us from it. He will swear to you his book. As the seed remains in us, the seed of the kingdom of the Lord of God, no one can destroy us. They cannot take us away from God. It's an impossibility. And thus be thou faithful unto death. I will give thee a crown of life. You believe that? I do. I'll stake everything about my life on that time of sin. And I hope to hold through the waters of the Jordan flow at my feet. I can walk across on dry ground in the pleasure of God and the Lord of heaven. So is the hope of everyone who names Christ as obedient to Him and looks to Him as the author and finish their faith with the joy set before you. You're the cross. to sit down in the majesty of the God. If you're subject to the gospel call, I have to obey the gospel to become a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. They're faithful to Him, but if you have been unfaithful, we urge you to repent of your sins, whatever they may be, Come confess it, we'll pray with you for you. 
the salvation once again be yours, you're restored to your first love. You're then subject to the great gospel call by Tim Hill, who stands in